And good morning, everyone. My name is Rich Sloma. Welcome to the New York State Archives webinar uh, entitled The New LGS-1 Featuring Records of Miscellaneous Governments. Today's presenter is Maria McCashin. Uh, Maria is the New York State Archives Regional Advisory Officer for our Capital District North Country Region. This region is made up of 14 counties from uh, stretching from Franklin County to Rensselaer County and everything in between. And I also want to mention we uh, also on the panel we happen to have Dennis Riley who is the Regional Advisory Officer for our, our Catskill or Hudson Valley Catskill region. He'll be here just in case uh, some questions come up. Um, uh, and at this point, uh, I just want to also point out that this webinar is being recorded. So uh, we ask that you uh, type any questions that you have in the chat box, and we will take them at the end of the presentation. And at this point, I will go ahead uh, and uh, turn the presentation over to Maria. Thank you, Rich. Oh, here's an ad for some upcoming webinar webinars and a link to our workshop schedule page where you can register for any of these webinars. Welcome to Introduction to Local Government Schedule Retention Schedule LGS one. I was just going to check, Maria, and make sure that uh, I didn't accidentally copy over too many pages. Um, Actually, it's, uh, this is uh, yesterday's. Okay. Uh, is, uh, is, let me just check to see the, is this the whole, this, okay, this is definitely yesterday's. All right, so let me, um, let me go ahead and close this, um, and I'm going to pull up. Pull up the uh, today's presentation. For some reason, I apologize. I I must have uh, I must have pulled up. Create oh yeah, I, it's uh, yep. I actually see what I did. Okay. Um, all right. Let me go ahead and pull up the presentation here. And. Uh, sure that I have the right uh, presentation. Here it is. I apologize. Uh, I must have uh, clicked on the uh, PowerPoint presentation in the previous file folder that I was in. And this should be coming up. Oh, here we go. Okay, Maria, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you. I don't have it on my screen. Uh, let's see. Oops. Maybe this is it. Let's see. Yeah, it may take a little bit of time. Yay. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, featuring records of miscellaneous governments. Uh, Rich sent you a, hand, uh, a copy of the slides, and you also have a handout of the items in the new schedule that this webinar will cover. The items on the handout are taken in their entirety from both the old MI1 schedule, unless they're a new item, and also the new LGS1 schedule. So you've got a comparison table. And they include changes and updates to some items uh, for, common, for records commonly found in local governments, such as administrative, fiscal, or personnel records. And they also include changes and updates to items for records unique to certain miscellaneous governments. So some of them may not relate to your government's records. And if that's the case, you can ignore those items. 
Uh, keep in mind this webinar is an overview of information about the new schedule. And if your organization would like more focused training, you can contact your regional advisory officer and request it. And the RAO or regional advisory officer contact information will be at the end of this webinar. And it's also on the State Archives website contact page. So these are some examples of miscellaneous governments whose records were previously covered by the MI1 schedule. Most of these had a specific section in the MI1 for records unique to their organization, like community college and soil and water conservation. And those sections are still part of the LGS1. This is our agenda. Today we're gonna start with some background information on the purpose of the LGS-1 and how to use it, and then focus on changes and updates in the new schedule. On the slide, you'll see the State Archives web address. And if you can, if you want to min minimize the webinar and take a moment to go to the State Archives homepage, you can either use this address or just Google NYS Archives, and it brings up the State Archives website. And when you get to the homepage, in the lower center portion of the homepage is a highlights section. And under highlights, if you click on the new local government retention schedule, LGS-1 is available. It takes you right to the LGS-1 page. Um, and that includes both the HTML version of the schedule, which is down the left-hand side of the page, and also the PDF version, which you can click on in the center of the page. I won't be able to give you a live demo during the webinar, so it may be helpful to switch back and forth between the webinar and that screen if um, you want to refer to the LGS-1 during the webinar. I will be referring to it, and you may want to look at the schedule as I do. These are the law and regulations associated with the LGS-1. The Arts and Cultural Affairs Law, also known as the Local Government Records Law, and the regulations of the Commissioner of Education. The law gives the State Archives authority over retention and disposition of local government records, working on behalf of the Commissioner of Education. Staff at the State Archives developed the schedule, and they did, did so by examining state and federal statutes, regulations, and policy, audit requirements, the need for legal evidence, administrative needs, and secondary use for historical or other research. They compiled a list of retentions, just like, as they did in the MI-1, and these were approved by the New York State Board of Regents after a public regulatory process. They compiled a list of retentions, um, and, excuse me, and um, the use of the schedule is addressed in section 57.25 of the law, and then the issuance of the schedule is covered under section 185.5b, of the regulations, and you've got a link to the law and the regulations in their entirety on the slide. Um, those are on the State Archives website. They're um, in a PDF format, which you can download. In their entirety, they provide guidance on how to develop policies and procedures to maintain an effective records management program to care for public records, which are essential for administering local governments. And pointing out the law and regulations can be a helpful starting point if you're introducing new board members or new staff to records management and the LGS-1. So the new schedule combines all four local government schedules. Previously, there was the CO2, the MU-1, the ED-1, and the MI-1. The MI-1 was last revised in 2006. That was 14 years ago, so an update was needed. New records and updates were added, and all the information was consolidated into one comprehensive schedule and given a new name, the official name, 
the retention and disposition schedule for New York local governments, easier name, the LGS-1. The section headings, or functional chapters, whichever you want to call them, are for the most part the same as those in the previous schedule. And I'll show you an example on the, the next slide. All the items have new numbers, and they also have references to the old numbers. So if you made no, a note of MI1 item numbers, you can keyword search, search those in the schedule in order to find the new items or the new item numbers. Major revisions, such as a change in a record's retention period, either longer or shorter, and any new items in the schedule are flagged with a black diamond. Minor revisions, like an expanded item description, have not been flagged. The adoption of the new schedule is required because it is a new document. It's not just a new version of your previously adopted schedule. And before you use it, your board must adopt it by resolution. You'll find a sample resolution in the LGS-1 introduction. And there's also a separate PDF on the State Archives website. I'm wondering, Rich, could you um, include a link to that PDF in the chat box? Yep, sure did, Maria. Just one. Oh, thank you. Yep. Uh, local governments must adopt the schedule by January 1st, 2021, because that's the date that the four previous schedules, including the MI1, will expire and no longer be valid. And these are the LGS-1 section headings without their subsections. They're, they do include subsections in the schedule, but not on this slide. So, for example, the fiscal section still has its audit, budget, banking, and other section, subsections. And if you were familiar with the MI1, these headings won't be new to you. A nice feature of the HTML version, I've noticed um, trying it out for its search capabilities, is when you search an item, the items return are returned with their section heading. And this can be helpful for determining whether you found the right item. So for example, if you search for a bid related to the purchase of a general service and your results return bids from the fiscal section and from the environmental health section and from the transportation and engineering section, you can know you, know you can rule out um, environmental health and transportation and engineering if you were searching for a bid related to a general service purchase. So what hasn't changed with the new schedule? It's still media neutral. The retention periods listed in the schedule pertain to information contained in the records regardless of their format. So the retention periods apply to one official copy of record regardless of whether its medium or its format is paper or electronic or microfilm or another format. The retention periods in the schedule still provide the minimum amount of time that you're legally required to retain one official copy of record. Once the minimum retention period is up, don't have to destroy the record, but we strongly advise that if you decide to keep a certain record longer than the minimum retention period, that you document the reason for that. And this will ensure that the record's managed consistently, and it'll also give you a means to defend record, uh, keeping a record longer should anyone question why the record still exists. The schedule doesn't address all records management issues, so it doesn't cover non-records, such as reference materials, blank forms, or publications from outside your organization like state or federal guidelines. You can dispose of those whenever you no longer need them. One thing we do recommend and is that you don't file non-record materials, regardless of format, paper or electronic. Um, don't file them with your records. File them separately from your records, and that will save you space and confusion in the long run. 
The schedule doesn't tell you how to destroy records, but it does provide some suggestions, and I'll cover those at the end of the webinar. It doesn't identify confidential or restricted information, and if you have questions about the confidentiality of a record, you can contact the Committee on Open Government, and their contact information is in the LGS-1 under Public Access to Records. Using the new schedule has the same advantages as using the MI-1. Identifying your records and applying their retention periods will ensure that your government keeps its records as long as needed to meet legal and fiscal requirements. The minimum retention period is also an indicator of when, he, when many records lose their value and can be destroyed. So destroying records you no longer need is a regular and important part of managing them. Also, if a record's retention is noted to be permanent, this will remind you to take steps to preserve it. Using the schedule to identify your records, to file them by record series, apply the retention period, and regularly dispose of obsolete records in any format will improve records retrieval by eliminating the time and effort required to sort through unneeded records to find the ones that you do need. And time saved on searches can save your organization money. Money can also be saved by regularly disposing of records and freeing up storage space for the addition of new records. Instead of buying more shelves, more filing cabinets, or more server space to accommodate records that aren't regularly disposed of. All of this can help make your work easier. And these advantage points are discussed in the LGS-1 introduction section under purpose of the schedule. And they can be good points to use to promote the use of the schedule in your organization. Now, as I mentioned, the LGS-1 is available on the State Archives website. Some of you may have already got it on your screen. It'll remain there for the foreseeable future until it's updated or replaced. And if you want to take a moment and switch screens and look at the LGS-1 page, as I mentioned on the left-hand side, you see the full schedule in HTML. Midway down the page, there's a link to the PDF version of the schedule. MI1 users will be happy that now the PDF version is fully keyword searchable if you choose to use the PDF version. But I also encourage you to try searching the HTML version using the search the schedule feature. I think that's the third, um, third on the table of contents list on the left-hand side of the page. So the search the schedule feature, when you click on that, um, it provides you with tips for searching for your searches. You can also request a paper copy of the schedule. You can do so by mailing rec management, R-E-C-M-G-M-T, at nyfcd.gov. And when you um, send your request to this email address, please include your mailing address. And Rich, would you type the rec management at nyfcd.gov in the chat box so people have that if they want to request a print copy? Yes. Yep, I'll go ahead and do that. Thank you very much. So regardless of which version of the schedule you use, to get started, you need to identify the record series because you need to know the record series in order to match it to an item in the schedule and determine its retention. So are you looking for the retention period of a bid or bank statements or registration records? These are examples of record series. And because the schedule is used by many local governments, most of the schedule item descriptions are described broadly and don't identify specific documents and forms. It can make using it a little bit tricky, but if you focus on the purpose or the function of the record, the reason it was created, by which department, this can help you narrow down your search. 
if it's not a record you use, if you're just managing it, you can um, talk with the people in the department that created the record, and they can assist you identifying the record series. So if you know the purpose or the function of the record, you can browse the schedule's functional headings and subheadings um, in the HTML version. They're on the left-hand side of the page. In the PDF, you'll find them in the table of contents. Determining the official record copy is important because the schedule only applies to one official copy. And if the official copy can be determined, documented, and ideally stored in one central location where it can be shared by everyone who needs access to it, this can help eliminate the need to create duplicates. And that can also help you manage your records. The PDF version has an index, and it's been expanded to include more terms. The index can be helpful for searching, and it can also give you a sense of the terminology used in the schedule. So don't hesitate to call your regional advisory officer if you're not sure what item to use if you're, or if you're having difficulty using the schedule. We, we love to hear from you and your feedback helps us improve and update the schedule. Another reason you may ha be having difficulty finding your, your item is because there may not be an item that matches the record that you're searching for. And if there's not a match, we've got to update the schedule. So feedback from you is how we update the schedule. Um, if there isn't an item to match your record, we'll also work with you to create a temporary item to use until the schedule is updated. Creating an office retention schedule may be the best way to use the LGS-1. This is a short list taken from the LGS-1 of just the records your office maintains may take a little time to identify the records in your office, match them to an LGS-1 item, and create an office retention schedule. But once you do, you can make records management much easier. Short, concise list of just the records your office maintains will prevent the need to review the entire LGS-1 every time you undertake records disposition. And you can help eliminate confusion if you um, haven't used the schedule in a while. The sample on the slide includes the minimum amount of information you should include, the record series, the LGS-1 item number, and the minimum retention period. Including the item number ties your new office retention schedule to the legal document, and also it allows you to easily refer back to the chosen item there's any question about it. Depending on, on your needs, you can add more columns. You might add a note field with information like decisions that were made to allow for longer retention periods for certain records, what formats the records exist in, methods for destruction, confidentiality information, transfer procedures, among other things. Your list can include the name that a record is commonly known by in your office, if that name isn't the same as the one used in the LGS-1 schedule. So all of this can help implement records management and make it part of regular business because staff and maybe you yourself are more likely to accept and use a simple, straightforward document that's easy to use and just contains key information on the records that are maintained in your office instead of referring to the longer LGS-1. An office retention schedule also qualifies as a subject matter list as required by the Freedom of Information Law. And you can also use the LGS-1 as your subject matter list, but an office schedule will provide you with the more specific list of the records held by your organization. And if you want to know more about creation of office retention schedules. We have a publication for that. Publication 41, Retention and Disposition of Records, How Long to Keep Records and How to Destroy Them. And I was wondering, Rich, could you include a link to publication 41 in the chat box? Sure will, Maria. Thank you very much.
Also, um, in the link included in, in the slide is a list of major revisions in the new schedule. So this is on our website. And it doesn't provide specific information on item numbers, but it does list the overall major revisions. So changes to the introduction, revisions under each functional section or chapter, and major um, meaning new items or retention period changes. So those are discussed in the list of major revisions. So it may be a useful starting point to get a sense of where there may be changes that affect your records. New unique numbers have been assigned to each item throughout the schedule. And as I mentioned, there are references to old schedule numbers for each item. And in September, we'll be posting more tools with cross references to new and old item numbers. The new general administration section now combines the former and general, the former general and miscellaneous sections. And there's a new executive section that combines supervisor, may, mayor, manager, administrator, county executive, school superintendent, any type of executive your, an organization might have into one section. So generally, records in their office include things like correspondence, memoranda, calendars, reports, contracts, other legal documents, and the retention period are generally either six year or permanent. The previous electronic data processing section has been given a more up to date name, information technology. And referring to the item list handout that I sent, the first three changes on that item list relate to the IT section. So you may want to alert your IT people. Item 1310, this is system backup files. The retention period for backup tape has been reduced from three to two years. And a sub item B was added to this item to include other incremental backups. Item 1312, for uh, computer system security records. The retention period was reduced from 10 to six years. And a new item, 1333, was added to cover security breach notifications. I also wanted to point out um, school districts and BOCES. Um, there's a new section that will retain the unique subsections for school districts and BOCES that were in the ED1 schedule, which all of you being miscellaneous governments did not use. So this is a huge, actually 10% of the schedule that you will not need to refer to because it won't pertain to your records related to school districts and BOCES. I thought you might like to know that there's 10% of the schedule that you can ignore. Now we're going to talk about some changes to records commonly found in many organizations in the general administration section and also on your item list. I did include um, office minutes and hearing proceedings, which have not changed, except that they're no longer number one. They used to be number one in all the schedules, um, but now there's a new subsection related to meetings and their item number is 47. But meeting files, um, which is now item 48, has a sub-item 48B to clarify and reduce the retention of certain meeting notes. And there's also a new item 49 added for internal meeting records of non-governing bodies. Those are for meetings not governed under the open meetings law. Item 51, recordings of voice conversations, also known as recordings of meetings, 
has a note added to distinguish these recordings from the public access television item, item 72. So video recordings of public hearings and meetings which have been broadcast on local government public access television are covered by item 72. A new item 50 was added for records of external group meeting files where the employee is a representative of the government. There's a reference to disadvantaged owned business DBE records. This was added to the existing minority and women owned business item number eight. Item 71, the item for publications and photos now includes any associated consent forms. In the personnel civil service section, there were two related items in the MI1 that were combined, item 318 and 723. They've now become item 645, employee benefit records. 645A, the employee benefit initial application and any subsequent updates has had its retention period lengthened from three to six years after termination of the employees dependent survivors or beneficiaries coverage, whichever is later. Additional sub items B, F, and G have been added for beneficiary designation records, health insurance payout programs, FML, FMLA, and COBRA compliance. And in the archive and records management section, premature Destruction um, has been now covered or is now covered by sub item 88C. So records that are destroyed or lost before their retention period expires. Documenting this information, if you didn't know, is a legal requirement of the State Department of Public Service, and the legal citation for that is included in item 88. Under the fiscal section, there are five new items for records. Item 477 is a new item for electronic banking records. Item 543 was added to cover requirements found in Government Accounting Standards Board's GASB Statements 45 and 75 as they relate to other post-employment benefits. These might include post-retirement medical, pharmacy, dental, vision, life, long-term disability, and long-term care benefits that are not associated with a pension plan. Item 523 was added to cover records related to tuition and job-related training reimbursements. Item 1171 was added to cover records of Universal Telecommunications and Information Services, or the E-Rate program for schools and libraries. And item 1172 was added to cover student financial aid records. There's still a more specific item, item 175, for student financial aid in the community college section. Item 1172 refers to um, adult students receiving financial aid for career and technical education at a BOCES. So a couple changes that might affect local development and public benefit corporations. In the general section, a note was added to the voice recordings item, item 51 regarding the general municipal law that industrial development agencies must post video recordings of open meetings and public hearings on their website for five years. And in the public property and equipment section, 
Item 825 was added for annual environmental audit report records that the DEC requires of some public benefit corporations. For library and library systems, I mentioned the E-rate program. Um, that's item 1171 in the fiscal section. I included it in here because uh, it relates to libraries. But specifically under the library and library system section, there were new items added. <clears throat> At item 595 was added for library card application records. Item 597 was added to cover interlibrary loan records. And item 603 was added to cover program and ex exhibit files and it includes sub-items for parental consent and registration records. For museums, there's a similar, but not the same, program and exhibit files item. Um, that's item 626 on, in the museum section. Soil and water conservation districts, a heads up. Um, there were two similar items that were consolidated. MI1 item 612 and CO2 item 359, those were combined and new item 43 was added to the general administration section. So not in the soil and water conservation section, but the general administration section. So it's not a major change, but if you're looking for it, that's where to look for it. It's records uh, created in the establishment change or dissolution of a county agricultural district. So now item 43 in the general section. It still has a permanent retention. These changes to the transportation and engineering section, they relate to records maintained by airports, transportation authorities, and possibly other municipalities. Item 1061, airport security and safety records has a new item, a new sub-item, 1061E, and this is for a security plan and airport registration, which are required by the New York State Department of Transportation, and the legal citation for that requirement is in the description. Item 1081, 1089, excuse me, has expanded the old item 562 in the MI1, and now it includes all parking permit records. So item 1089 is all parking permit records now, not just handicapped parking permit records. These changes to the public property and equipment section may also relate to records maintained by airports, transportation authorities, and possibly other municipalities. Item 823, Petroleum Bulk Storage Registration Records. Two sub-items have been added. Sub-item H covers denied registration applications. Sub-item I covers documentation on underground piping. Item 830, Building Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Project Files has a new sub-item B for Lead Abatement Project Files. Item 825, we mentioned this before, this is the item for the annual environmental audit reports submitted to the DEC by, pump, by some public benefit corporations. Item 826, Facility Health and Safety Inspection Records. This item description has been expanded from individual inspections and summary of findings to include specific records related to inspections. So if you look at the description, the description is more specific. And the retention period was changed from three years after last entry to three years after completion of inspection or after any violations are remedied, whichever is longer. Item 814, property inventory records. 
the retention period of superseded property inventories was increased from zero to six years after superseded. These uh, changes in the public health section may affect records of consolidated health districts and possibly other municipalities. Item 771, the retention period for environmental health test results was increased from three to five years. And item 802 is a new item added covering health incident files, public health incident files, including records related to public health emergencies, communicable disease occurrences and epidemics like COVID-19 or West Nile virus. For community college section, there are some new items. Item 182 is a new item added to cover fire safety disclosure records for on-campus student housing. Item 218 is a new item covering student coursework, including papers, homework, and other assignments, whether or not they're graded. And item 155 is a new item for assignment of program lists. These are annual cumulative lists of professors' teaching hours used for the selection of courses to teach. Some new sub-items and changes related to uh, community college is um, item 198, campus safety records. Sub-item 198B, notice of availability of the annual security report has had its retention increased from three to six years after issued, superseded, or obsolete, whichever is later. 198E crime logs was expanded to include additional document types, and this is per the U.S. Department of Education Office of Post-Secondary Education's Handbook for Campus Safety and Security Reporting, um, Chapter 9 to be specific. The retention period for this item was increased from three to six years as required by the handbook. Sub-items 198F and 198G were added to cover new requirements brought about by changes to the Campus Security Act related to missing persons procedures, including notification and emergency response, evacuation and policy, evacuation policy and procedures, and fire safety disclosure records on on-campus student housing. Item 205, admission records. Um, Sub-item 205B, admission records for applicants who are accepted and do not attend, and applicants who are not accepted. The retention period was increased from two to three years following the date of exclusion or end of permitted enrollment period for applicants. And this is a new state education department regulation. Item 208, covering student information systems was updated to clarify retention periods for student basic information and financial aid data. Cooperative extension, um, items 245, 244, 245, 246, 247, 248, and 249 have had their item descriptions that previously described expanded food and nutrition education program updated to Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Education, or Eat Smart New York. And a new item was added in this section to cover 4-H membership records. In the electric and gas utility section, we've added a note to remind those who are using the schedule, that this section covers records of a local government that generates its own power and or operates its own electric and gas utilities. So not to be confused with other electric and gas utility records. Item 383 was expanded beyond just 
subsidiary, subsidiary ledger or journal item to include general ledgers, general journals, and journal vouchers. New items were added in this section. Item 376 was added to cover a resident application to connect to municipal gas or electric systems. Item 384 was added to cover cash transaction records or cash books of a gas or electric utility. And item 385 was added to cover life or mortality study data created for depreciation purposes. This is a requirement of the public of the Department of Public Service, and it requires that this data be retained permanently. So that was an overview of miscellaneous local government records changes and updates. And you've got um, the complete items in the item handout list. So this is the end of the part of the webinar that discusses changes and updates. I just would like to um, point out some important information that's available to you in the schedule's introduction. So the introduction includes a section, Suggestions for Making Records Disposition Regular Practice in Your Organization. And it suggests that you, um, it suggests that you designate an RMO, but you're required to under the Arts and Cultural Affairs Law, Section 5719, but it reminds you to do it and to have your RMO coordinate or directly carry out records disposition and make it regular. So regularly do it at least once a year and don't wait until it becomes a pressing storage problem in any format. It also makes a suggestion for records destruction, suggesting that you recycle um, because it helps conserve natural resources and also may generate some revenue for your organization. It reminds you to be sure that confidential records are destroyed completely to protect um, personal identifying information and other restricted information. It suggests that you document records destruction and you can do this by using a destruction authorization form which is discussed, and there's a sample in publication 41 that I mentioned and Rich included in a link to in the chat box. Or you can ask your regional advisory officer for a sample records destruction authorization form. It also suggests that your records management officer provide your governing body or your board with an annual report on records disposed of throughout the year. This is a good way to keep management aware of the importance of records management and make it part of regular business. The introduction of the LGS-1 also includes a section, important reminders, and these are important reminders for managing your records. We discussed some of them. Um, I'll just point out a couple. Records created before 1910, regardless of the records retention period or even regardless of whether they've been filmed or scanned, are not eligible for destruction without permission from the state archives. So if you would like to dispose of records before 1910, contact your regional advisory officer and they'll discuss that with you. Um, we mentioned that records must be in the schedule. So if you don't find them in the schedule, don't just, just of them, contact your regional advisory officer and they'll help you find an item or assign you, help you uh, with the creation of a temporary item until the schedule has been updated. Records used in legal actions must be retained for one year after the legal action ends or until their scheduled retention period has passed, whichever is longer. If you get a Freedom of Information Law request, um, those records should not be destroyed unless the request has been answered and also until any potential appeal has been made and resolved, um, even if the retention period of the record has passed. Records being kept beyond established, the established retention period for audit or other purposes at the request of the state or federal agencies 
must be retained until the local government receives the audit report or the need is satisfied. We mentioned one official copy, we mentioned the schedule is neutral. It's also important to keep in mind that all historical records may not be identified with a permanent retention period. So there may be some records unique to your organization that um, should be retained longer for potential research or historical value. So you wanna make sure that officials in your organization know that they may need to appraise certain records with non-permanent retention for potential value, permanent value. And this may be um, important in particular now uh, during the COVID ep epidemic. Um, it's an unprecedented event in your organization. So there may be certain records that you need to retain permanently that are not permanent in order to document this event. You mentioned confidential records. Um, also, if you're maintaining certain health-related records, um, um, some of them may be sub, some of them may be need to kept, be kept one year longer if they're subject to requirements stated in Section 29.2 of the New York Code of Rules and Regulations for health professionals other than physicians employed or associated with local governments. We mentioned the model resolution, and I, I believe um, there is, um, you'll find a model resolution in the introduction of the LGS-1. We included uh, a link to it on the State Archives website, and you know that the schedule has to be adopted before January 1st, 2021, before um, which is the date that the MI-1 will no longer be valid. This is a contact information for your regional advisory officer. That person uh, depends on what county you're in. So please make contact with your regional advisory officer. Um, just send them an email, let them know who you are, and they can add you to their listserv, and we send information about training and grants and other records management news. And um, we really value, actually we need your comments about using the schedule because that's how we improve the schedule and make updates to the schedule. And the schedule is for your records, so we wanna make sure we provide you with the most effective tool we can for managing your records. And we've come to the end of the webinar. Thank you so much for making time to attend today, and um, if we have questions, we can take those now. Yes, hi, Maria. We do have a few questions. Um, uh, so I'll just let the, uh, give folks some time to type in their questions if they have some at this point, but uh, since we've got a little bit of time here, um, Jim uh, sent a question earlier, and uh, we chatted back and forth about he may end up going to his regional advisory officer, uh, but he was just basically, uh, he was asking this question, uh, I am hoping to get some clarification uh, on current New York State mandates that employers, including public employers, uh, ask employees and visitors to complete COVID-19 health assessments prior to entering the building. Uh, New York State repeatedly indicates these records may not be retained, uh, but a log, log that assessments were completed can and or should be maintained. Does New York State Archives agree with New York State on destroying the health assessments after they have been reviewed? So I don't know, maybe this is something a little bit bigger outside the scope of this or? Well, I think we have had related questions and off the top of my head, I don't remember how we responded, but um, we can, um, if Jim wants to give us his email address, we can send him, or actually we can respond to the group, um, but we have had questions related to um, the, um, these assessments. Okay, so we'll, as more information comes out, we can get certainly get that out. Also, uh, Joe asks, um, why would we ever have to, quote unquote, defend keeping a record longer than required? Um, because you've adopted the schedule by resolution, so the schedule with its minimum retention period is your policy for managing your records. 
and if you go against that policy, um, it's a good idea for succession purposes and to defend your records management practices to have documentation if you're not going to follow the schedule. Okay, uh, Karen asks, what about Zoom meeting and telephone meetings? I guess uh, keeping the records for that. So those would follow the same retention periods for the meetings that are in the schedule under the general section. Um, as they relate to the meeting. So if it's, um, you know, the uh, regular um, public attended meeting, you know, your, your regular meetings of your board, those would follow um, item 40, now item 47. If they are, we now have the item for non-governing, meetings of non-governing bodies. So if that's the type of meeting, it is, then you'd follow that item number. So it depends on the type of meeting that you're having. Okay, uh, Wanda asks, uh, are association public libraries subject to records retention, the records retention schedule? Could you say that one more time? Sure, are association public libraries subject to the records retention schedule? Yes. Okay, uh, Nancy. Um, I mean, if they're a local, I believe they're local governments. Um, and if we know this, if they want to put in the chat box the specific local government um, or the specific association public library, we can double check. Um, but association public library, I believe that's a local government and it, all local governments are covered by the schedule or should be following the schedule. Okay, I see. Um, I see Wanda has just uh, responded here. She said, no, they are not. So I'm not sure if. No, they are not a local government? That would seem. Okay. Oh, uh, Wanda says here, she adds, they are chartered as a quote unquote private entity. Okay, so they're a nonprofit 5013C. Let's see if. Uh... Response on that. Okay. Um, well, it, I mean, bottom line, if they're not a local government, they aren't required to adopt the schedule. Um, but if they were trying to create a schedule for their records, they could use it as a model. Uh, just to jump in here, not to. This is actually one of the issues I always find confusing when is a library a... Dennis, you may want to get a little closer to your microphone. Oh, sorry, I put it up above my head so I didn't interrupt earlier. Um, but I'm going to put in the chat, there's a great little chart on the state library page that compares the types of libraries and when is a public library uh, a local government or not, and it does seem like association libraries are shaded a different color than the than say a municipal school district or special district public library. So I think that may help clarify it because it's saying that uh, association library employees are not covered by civil service. Um, they're not permitted for bonding authority. So it does seem like they are um, outside that definition of a local government. But this is a question that always confuses me, so. Okay, but if it is determined that they're not a local government, um, they, they aren't required to adopt the schedule, but if they wanted to develop one of their own, they could use it as a model. They would just have to make sure that they've researched any other laws or regulations that associate with their records to ensure that they're keeping them long enough. Okay, um, let's see. Oh yes, uh, Wanda said, thanks Dennis, that is correct. So, and she says, thank you. Okay, we had uh, folks also asked if we could put the contact information thing and back up, which I did. Uh, I went ahead and just repasted in uh, how, where you can find the LGS-1, uh, where you can find the sample resolution form, uh, how to contact a regional advisory officer, 
And if you would like a print copy of the new LGS-1 to email us at RECMGMT, which is short for recommend, Records Management, RECMGMT, at NYSED.gov. So I put that back up in the chat box. Thank you. Please include your mailing address, too, and the email. Yes, that is correct. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, also a couple more questions popped up here. Um, from Nancy, regarding item 603, would that also apply to exhibits done by our city historian uh, slash city archives? So exhibits done at the library? Let's see if Nancy will uh, clarify that. Yes, Nancy says yes. Yeah, it's, it's any program. I shouldn't have had her need to respond. It, it is, would be any program or exhibit um, at the library. OK, we um, have a question here. Uh, we had asked our regional advisory, advisory officer regarding the COVID screenings, and we were instructed to use LGS 1792E, which has a retention of one year. So I guess that um, was a response to the earlier question. Um, um, all right, other than that, I, uh, oh, that, oh, she was just answering, yes. So thank you, Griselda, she just chimed in here. Well, we are at uh, after uh, 11 a.m., so uh, don't see any other questions coming in. So again, I would just uh, point out to folks, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us. Uh, contact your regional advisory officer, or you can email us at uh, arctrain at nised.gov, and we can get you to the uh, right place. Well, I'm just putting that uh, email in there. So it looks like we've concluded, Maria. Maybe some last words from you before we say goodbye? Uh, I just say thank you and um, enjoy the LGS-1 and please give us your feedback so that we can improve it for where it needs improvements and update it where it needs updates. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dennis and Rich. <laughs>